Hello, and welcome to the ABIX webinar, Helping to Realize the Potential of Supply Chain Management by Looking Beyond the Horizon, with Stephen A. Melnick, PhD, and John Schull. My name is Christopher Jablonski with APIX. And please note that this presentation is being recorded and will be available at apix.org slash online events starting within the next few days. Before we begin, I'd just like to run through a few details. At the end of the presentation, we'll save time for a Q&A session. If you look at the right toolbar on your screen, you'll see a questions box. <clears throat> to ask a question to our panelists at any time during the presentation, simply type it in the box and click send. And should you experience any technical difficulties during today's broadcast, please call GoToWebinar Tech Support at 1-805-617-7000. And now I'm going to turn it over to our host for today's webinar, Stephen Melnick. And uh, Steve, it's my pleasure to, to introduce you, and you can begin. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, which is being jointly presented by APEX and Michigan State University and the Beyond the Horizon research team. The topic of today's presentation is, is your company realizing the true potential of your supply chains? And it's the one we're going to look at. In order to help you deal with this, uh, Chris, could you advance the slide, please? Let's see. I believe that's on your end. Let's see if you can uh, try that. Try clicking in the middle of the screen, and that might get you back in there. Okay. There we go. First of all, let me introduce the presenters. My name is Stephen A. Melnick. I'm a professor of operations and supply chain management at in the Department of Supply Chain Management at the DLI Broad Graduate School of Business, Michigan State University. If you wish to get hold of me, the contact information is found right there. My co-presenter with us, and it's my indeed my pleasure, is John Scholl. John Scholl is currently Director of Systems Supply Chain Management at Spectrum Health, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Previously, he was Vice President and CPO Chief Procurement Officer at Steelcase, which is where I first got to know John. And he brings with him a very large wealth of information and knowledge about the supply chain. He can be contacted at the following information address. We're going to break this down into a very simple presentation. We're going to try to set the stage and have you understand what's going on by asking the question, what's going on in the supply chain management in the 21st century? We expect this is going to take about five minutes. Then we're going to ask you a question, and this is an interesting question. This is one where in the Beyond the Horizon project, we have asked nearly every respondent, and the insights we've gotten have been very good insightful, which is, what keeps you up at night? And in order to answer this, we're going to give you some thoughts, but more importantly, we're going to ask John Scholl, what keeps him up at night? Then what we're going to do is use that information to transition into supply chain management beyond the horizon, a research initiative currently being undertaken by the Department of Supply Chain Management, Michigan State University, and sponsored jointly by APEX. That we estimate will take 10 minutes. We'll take a look at what we've learned, why investing in planning does not necessarily translate into better performance, and then how do you build a foundation that enables the supply chain to be a strategic weapon. Next, we're going to give you an several ways. We're going to give you a presentation, an invitation to participate in several ways. We're going to invite you to participate as a participant in the upcoming uh, workshop we're going to have at Michigan State, and more importantly, to participate as a part of our study. And finally, we're going to have about 20, we estimate we'll have about 20 minutes for questions and answers. Well, let's talk about the setting. The point we want to start off with, and I think it doesn't come as a surprise to anyone that supply chains are no longer linear. They're dynamic. They're complex. They are environments which are which the issues are changing. What's shaping these environments? Well, first of all, there's a sense of speed, of urgency. When we've talked with various people in this topic, we've heard them say that you have to do certain things better than you've ever done before. You have to be able to sense changes, assess them, formulate a response, quickly deploy that response, recalibrate your objectives in light of the actions, and then learn and repeat this again over and over again. 
it doesn't come as a surprise it's also being driven by technological changes what you have here is a 3d printer you can we've now seen how we can use 3d printers to make guitars the United States military the American Red Cross is now experimenting with the whole notion of using 3d printing to create food in the field so what does this mean this means that this is an environment in which lead times are rapidly falling in which flexibility and responsiveness is increasing in value it's also being driven by Amazon this is an interesting response because when we talk with companies especially those companies working in industries which were competing with Amazon we found that people talked about Amazon why did they talk about Amazon because Amazon first and foremost is a global marketplace it offers fast shipping it offers low prices it offers re result reviews more importantly it is backed by an excellent supply chain it is continuously pushing the balance redefining how we compete finally what makes Amazon so interesting is that they are a company which continues to learn about you and tries to customize its offerings to you it's being driven by change change in all its various forms it's also being driven by the business model when we talk about the business model and this is important we're finding that people are no longer talking about strategy they're talking about the business model and the business model is a key theme to today's presentation because it brings together three critical elements your key customer who it is you target the value proposition which is characterized by four traits what is it that you offer that the customer is willing to pay for how does it dif differentiate you in the marketplace now that's important today's competition is not based on being same as but being different from to what extent do the does the value proposition meet or exceed or satisfy the test the company's strategic and financial requirements which is one reason IBM got out of the ThinkPad business the ThinkPads were not generating enough money and finally capabilities and by the way the fourth point of the value propositions are they supported by capabilities and capabilities are critical because it's here that the supply chain enters this consists of issues like uh, processes capacity infrastructure performance measurement the C word culture in fact I'll give you something to think about yesterday in the Wall Street Journal there was an interesting article about how Zappos is trying to redefine their organization and focus it around being responsive based on culture and finally the supply chain to what extent does the supply chain satisfy what you're trying to do and what we're trying to say is the following when what the customer expects what you promise and what you can deliver are consistent value occurs and the final thing is we're starting to recognize the truths of supply chain management the truths are fairly self straightforward Today's supply chain is the result of investments we've made in the past. You know what that means? Tomorrow's supply chain is going to be a result of the investments you and others make. However, these investments are often driven by concerns that keep us awake at night. So, John, what keeps you up at night? Well, I think. Uh Steve, do you want to go through some of these concerns first? Let me talk about some of the concerns. For example, we found that there, the concerns we found are not having enough capacity to meet tomorrow's demands. Unknown technology. And this is important because we're starting to see companies introduce technology and using it in ways not previously done. For example, I became aware of a company by the name of Square, which is now using technology to enable small firms to do uh, credit card vouchers using a smartphone it's also threats due to things like the environment economics political world wars earthquakes it's also being due to threats from the firm from non-traditional market entrants specifically I'll give you a good example everyone's heard about the new Apple I iWatch right now the people who are most concerned are the traditional Swiss watch manufacturers because this represents a company which previously had never been seen as a threat coming into its market and taking potential sizable segments of its market share something they never expected how about putting everything together and having all the pieces work 
which means not only having the individual parts, but having them work together, both not only within the firm, but between partners in the firm. How about the need or the concerns about the lack of an ad adaptive, responsive culture? Culture is critical. The concern is, what if the culture doesn't understand or accept the need for change? What if the culture resists? That's the concern we're faced by. So that the organization finds itself fighting you as you lead the change. One thing we've heard about from our, from our participants has been this concept of complexity. And one of the things that they've pointed out is that this represents a major transition. Why? In the past, complexity was something we avoided. Complexity we try to simplify. We try to break things down. Now what we're recognizing is that complexity is important if it's what your customer wants, if it's what your customer is demanding, if it's what your customer is willing to pay for. By the way, complexity is different from complicated. Complicated are things we do to ourselves as a result of changes taken elsewhere. Complexity is what the customer wants and they're willing to pay for. One area that we heard about a lot about was government regulations and compliance, not only within the United States, but internationally. We've heard about companies talking about the fact that they're going into markets where a small segment of the market has an enormous impact because it is protected by government regulations and compliance issue, issues. We're hearing about planning, and specifically planning for disruptions and risk. How about the issue of not acting with enough speed? The issue nowadays is it's not enough to sit back and deliberate. In today's environment, we've got to act quickly. We've got to act decisively. We're not going to be accurate, but we have to be able to take an action, learn, evaluate, and then change. Talent management and leadership. One thing that we've heard from our participants, and we've heard about when we've asked this question, what keeps you up at night is the following. They're concerned about the whole issue of how do we identify Recruit, train, educate, evaluate, develop, promote, and retain the best leadership. And this is becoming important because as we're going to show you later on in this presentation, in today's environment, the issue is no longer having the best scheduler. It's having people who can act and think strategically in the firm. And finally, there are price pressures and issues of sustainability. When we talk about sustainability, what we're talking about is not simply environmental, which is becoming increasingly required, but more importantly issues such as, is it fair to the people involved? Last week, for example, New York State had indicated they were going to be trying to uh, ensure that there would be a, a living wage of, of $15. And other, other cities are starting to increase their wages as they reflect the issue of fairness for people. And finally, is the business model sustainable? Can the business model not only work today, but can it be made to work in the future? So these are the things that we heard about from our participants. Well, let's turn around and ask you. And this is where we get audience participation. So what we're going to do is we are going to turn things open, and we're going to ask you to pick one of the following and tell us what keeps you up at night. Is it unknown technology? Is it threats to the firm from non-traditional market entries? Is it governmental regulations and compliance concerns? Is it sustainability? And is it talent management and leadership? Vote now. The poll is open. By the way, if we were to do this in the future, we would hear the Alex Trebek Jeopardy song going on in the background. And I think we've got a, a good amount of people voting, so. And things back to me, please. Okay, let's get back. And anyway, so we're, we're going to be, as we tabulate your results, let's kind of go on. Now I can turn around to John, and I can say to him, John, what keeps you up at night? What keeps you up at night? <laughs> The um, is an interesting question.
question. I think we've all probably thought of that from time to time. And the things that are keeping me up at night probably are some of the same things that are keeping you up at night. So I'll talk in general about the things that I worry about from a supply chain organization. And, and it's what are the tools and strategies that we can bring to help impact the business, but it's prioritizing them. So in our particular case, there's so much change going on in healthcare driven largely through healthcare reform and changes with the consumer being more involved in their healthcare selection choices, that this is the kind of you know, tumultuous change going on in an industry that I, I've never seen before, um, you know, putting pressure on the business to change. And the question is, is supply chain doing everything they can to bring the right tools? And there's lots of tools that, that haven't existed in healthcare before that because of this change, it's putting a spotlight on lots of areas of change and, and supply chain is a, is a big one that can have a significant positive impact. So, um, you know, first of all, just prioritizing, there's so many things to do. What are the first things that we can do that make the most impact? And then along with that, what's, what kind of a, a leadership role can supply chain take where in, in health systems, they haven't traditionally looked at supply chain as a potential leader and yet with the kind of backgrounds we have working across in, in cross-functional settings, mobilizing people through very complex situations, I happen to think that supply chain is in a perfect role to be able to provide the kind of leadership and healthcare that's needed. And then lastly, because most of the people that are within um, healthcare have, have spent their entire careers in healthcare, they, they just don't have the benchmarking and the experience in outside industries to bring those tools and strategies that have been successful elsewhere and adapt those and apply those into healthcare so we could do something. So making sure that our people have the right skills to be a part of leading this transformation is a, a really big issue uh, for me. Those are the type of things that keep me up at night. So Steve, if you could click, click to the next slide. So I was asked to just briefly, as coming from 20 years at Steelcase and, and studying lots of other industries, moving into something as different as healthcare, one of the things that I get asked about a lot is what are the differences between healthcare and other industrial supply chains? And, and there's the this uh, metaphor of the movie, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, a classic Clint Eastwood movie that happened to be uh, come out in 1966. It's, it's, um, it's very appropriate in that there's a lot of things that are great and then things that aren't working as well in healthcare, but also the 1966 feels like about the the uh, maturity of supply chain relative to some other really mature supply chain industries. It feels like we're about that many years behind. So if you could go to the next slide, there are really four big areas that I feel like are, are uh, the most, uh, the biggest areas that, that need supply chain help uh, that are part of the overall puzzle in healthcare. And, and one is aligned incentives. And, and Steve, I think if you click there, there'll be some more detail. There's a radical change that's undergone um, in, in our industry on the revenue side. The revenue model has changed forever. The way we get reimbursed through insurance companies and, and Medicare, it's already changed. And yet um, we have suppliers, for instance, in our industry that are still on the same legacy track that they've been on before in terms of how they get incented and their profit margins. And there's a complete disconnect, unlike what you see in most other industries, where there's, you know, profit margins are relatively well aligned between customers and suppliers. Uh, that is just not the case here. So we've got a lot of legacy incentives that are actually encouraging the supply base to behave the way they used to behave when at a health system standpoint, it's, it's, uh, it's forever changed and very abruptly. If you hit the next one on sourcing and pricing discipline, one of the things I've, I've observed is in this industry, there's a really strong focus on price. So if a supplier offers you a three or 5% price reduction, you're really happy about it, but there's a, a lack of understanding of the underlying cost. And because we don't make things in, in, uh, in a health system, we, we buy finished goods items that others make, um, we, we don't really understand the design and the, in the underlying manufacturing costs like a lot of you would have where you're specifying a product to a supplier and you understand the inputs really well. And I would say just in general, our sourcing and pricing discipline from a supply chain standpoint in, in healthcare is really immature. It needs to uh, grow up and, and um, evolve into a much stronger understanding of things like should be uh, uh, cost models. 
and, and we also in this industry we buy a lot through group, group purchasing organizations or co-ops of hospitals that get together and and because we share pricing among each other then the suppliers know that when they end up we end up, we end up sharing the pricing and we can see what other people are paying they're very reluctant to give us the uh, pricing because they know if they give it to us everyone's going to see it so there's a very complicated um, system of, of rebates behind the scene and off invoice uh, deals to try to hide the pricing and that that's driven kind of a bad discipline overall in pricing that needs to change. Then the next one is product quality and uh, this is a big surprise to me that, that we in this industry rely heavily on the FDA to set our quality standards whereas in most industries it's, it's the customer that's setting those strategies and they're uh, very uh, actively involved in, in forcing the supply base to uh, really reach a very, very high level of, of product quality. And, and frankly, the FDA is just not staffed or capable of setting the kind of standards we need in healthcare. So in the past, there's been waste, there's been lots of policing of, of quality that has to be done by nurses and physicians, but we just can't afford to do that in the new model uh, going forward. And so um, what I've also noticed is, is a really significant um, over-reliance by our suppliers in this industry on customer complaints. And it's just absolutely the worst thing that they can do. Um, not all suppliers, but, but a, a lot of surprising amount of suppliers that I've run into, their whole quality system is really driven by whether they're getting a lot of complaints or not versus doing lab testing, life cycle testing on things like artificial knees and pacemakers and even some drugs, um, it's really surprising that they um, don't have this whole reliance on, on uh, customer complaints, which again is a, a link back to there's just been this big disconnect between customers setting the quality standards and the suppliers. And the last one is supplier collaboration. And in general, in our industry, because of the legacy of suppliers whining and dining doctors, there's been a huge amount of distrust from health systems to suppliers. And in most cases, it just doesn't even occur to uh, uh, you know executives and sourcing people and clinicians in a health system. The suppliers can help with their big problems, like uh, reducing the amount of hospital-acquired infections or readmissions after a surgery. So, um, the whole supplier collaboration thing that many of our, us are used to in, in industry is just a way of life. It, it doesn't occur to the health systems in a lot of cases to ask for help. And then uh, the last one is obviously it, it also works on an innovation standpoint where suppliers have a lot of ideas and research and, and engineering and we've got doctors that have uh, knowledge and they, they see product gaps but they don't necessarily know where to go to. So those are the kind of things we're working on that are very new in healthcare but, but bringing uh, tools and strategies from outside that, uh, that can help us uh, you know, bring value to the organization. You know, so you know, John, you know, as I look at this, the materials that you've given us, you know, it's kind of ironic. Even though you claim that these are very unique to the healthcare field, we've encountered concerns over those very same issues in talking with the managers who we've interviewed as part of the On the Horizon. So what you're talking about is not unique to healthcare. It's kind of broad-based. I think so, too, Steve. I'd just say that, that what's different is on the continuum of trying to be the best we can possibly be in, in our supply chain discipline. I think that healthcare is, is further on the edge of, of, say, the left side of the continuum if you're moving right, being um, uh, as best as you can possibly be. I would agree with you that most organizations would, would uh, struggle with, with some of these topics. Uh, I just, it feels like supply chain is further down that uh, continuum, which happens to represent a great opportunity. It's, for people who are um, more into you know building and developing um, things versus maintaining, healthcare is just a fantastic environment to be a part of right now. Great. And then there were some additional observations that are just different about being in healthcare, and and you can read the list. I'm not going to cover all of them, but I did want to highlight number three and four. That, that I said this before, but hospital administrators just do not look at supply chain as a strategic competency, and that's something I'm sure you all are smiling at that you wish you had you know, more respect and were at the table more than what you are today. It's, it's part of that pursuit of something that 
you may call perfection, but it's where we all want to be. Um, but I think that in many cases, you know, you have uh, C-suite levels that are overseeing supply chain, and, and for the most part, we're really working hard to get our own administrators to even acknowledge that both the supply base as well as their supply chain teams can be a strategic competency. And it's being really well received. It's just one of those matters of they haven't ever had exposure in their careers to that before. So it's fairly, uh, fairly much a foreign concept. And then, um, John, if I can just add a couple of comments to that. You know, I, I can, I'll disagree with you. I think a lot of the stuff that you've highlighted there, we've kind of seen occur from our from the beyond the horizon, uh, making people understand that supply chain is not a competency. In many cases, it's an asset. It's a weapon. Understanding that you know we not only have significant understaffing, but there's a concern over having the right skills. Uh, the notion of not only uh, the issue of business continuity, the notion of segmented supply chains. Wow, those things are things that are just not unique to, to healthcare. My gosh, we see them everywhere. That's true, and, and um, I think it's something that as leaders we really have. We, we can either accept the fact that that's the way it is or we can do something to change it. It takes a lot of you know, time and effort and, um, and uh, relationships to try to convince the leaders of that value. But, but I'd, I'd argue that we all believe that that value is there and that it's untapped for our organizations. And so um, you know, there are some differences about healthcare, but I, I, to Steve's point, I think what you're seeing is these are things we all um, struggle with. It, it just feels like being in healthcare for a year, like we're many years behind. I also think because of number one, the fact that in healthcare we don't make anything, I think it actually is going to allow uh, healthcare supply chains, um, because of the impetus of change that they're undergoing right now, the incredible stress, that they have the potential um, from an agility standpoint to pass a lot of the legacy systems uh, that are out there that have to deal with manufacturing plants and, and cumbersome supply chains that that we're lucky enough not to have. I think we can turn and transition a lot faster. But it's cultural, it's talent, it's relationships, it's it's selling, it's strategy, it's you know knowing the right tools to put in place. Um, all of them, you know, pretty exciting time to be in healthcare supply chain. Now, John, I think you know maybe at this time it's time for us to take a look and find out what keeps what what keeps the participants, the attendees, up at night. So, Chris, if you could give us an idea, what is it that keeps people up? And as we look at the screen, guess what? Of the participants who voted, 33% have told us that it is talent management. Number two, sustainability. Number three, uh, with 17%. Government regulations and compliance. Number four, unknown technology with 15%. And number five, in the last, threads to the firm with 14 You know, it's kind of interesting when you look at these results that except for talent management, they're fairly close to each other. So there are a lot of things which are keeping you people up at night. So can, if I can have the control back, Chris. Thank you. Technology is wonderful except when it doesn't work. So this is kind of the glitch. Anyway, so as we were trying, okay, oh, by the way, before I go any further, uh, just a, one observation. What we've done is we have a larger survey, which is a bit more fine, a bit more developed than the one that you saw. And it's available, and there will be a link sent to you via email. And the Qualtrics link is one that's available, and what it's going to do, it's going to list the 13 issues, and what we're going to ask you to do is to take 100 points and distribute them amongst the 13. If you think one of them is critical, put all 100 there. If you think two are critical, put two with 50. But at the end of the day, no more. That gives us a better idea of what things keep you up at night. So again, the information will be coming to you within the next 48 hours. It takes about two minutes to do. You know, as we were starting, and as you listen to John, you know, you, you know, John is sitting there saying, and this is a conversation I've had with John. He's saying, "This is you, this is kind of what we see." But what we what we started to do is we envisioned the challenge that's facing you. We we almost thought about the challenge of building a bridge. And if you think about a building a bridge, on the left hand side you see where we are. This is where you currently are located, and it's where you begin. But it's not necessarily where you want to be. That's over on the right. 
So what do you do? You build a series of, pi of, of supports. The first support you build, as you can see on the, on the left, is drivers. And what do we mean by drivers? We mean things that changes, the factors that are influencing us. By that we mean technology, the government, politics, the environment, competition. These are the things, both internal and external, which are shaping, influencing how you think. Well, then we build another set of supports. What's the other set of supports? It's strategy. What is it we offer? How do we compete? How do we, what is it we do that makes us different in, in the marketplace and attractive? How do we organize the organization so it's best able to deliver on the promises? What type of practices do we use? Do we use lean? Do we use TQM? What is it that we use? And these are generic. Now, here's an interesting factor. If I just stop there, I don't get to the other side. There's a gap. That gap is important. Let me give you something to think about. In March of this year, 2015, the Harvard Business Review prints an article. It's called, Why Strategy Execution Unravels and What to Do About It. The article begins by stating that they did a study of over 400 executives from across the world. And one of the, what they did is they asked a question similar to the one that we asked you. What keeps you up at night? You know what they found? The most single important issue that keeps them up at night, it wasn't technology, it wasn't sustainability, it was execution. How do you take the plans from strategy, structure, and practices, and how do you cross that chasm? How do you get to where we want to be? And firms have now recognized that having the best possible strategic system in place, having the best structure, having the most appropriate practices, while necessary, is not enough. Something more has got to be done. And we're starting to uncover that something more. And how are we uncovering it? Through the Beyond the Horizon project. And what we're doing is pointing out that if you focus on drivers, which is on the extreme left, if you focus on structure, strategy, and practices, the second pylon from the left, you don't have enough. There's a gap. In order to cross the chasm, in order to realize, in order to ensure that you arrive where you want to be, you have to do more. You have to have capabilities. And capabilities are practices which are put together so they work with each other. They're put together so they fit within the organization. They make sense to the organization. They make sense to the culture. They make sense to the physical environment. And then finally, competencies. How do you take the capabilities and how do you make, how do you configure them so that they add value for the customer and they help us differentiate our firm in the marketplace? Those two peers are the ones that we're finding are extraordinarily important but often overlooked. So consequently, firms are faced by the fact that they have where they are, where they're going to, but they don't cross that chasm. That leads us into the project, and I'm proud to be a part of this project. It's called Supply Chain Management Beyond the Horizon, as previously noted. It is jointly sponsored by APEX and the Supply Chain and the Department of Supply Chain Management, Michigan State University. It is a, the latest in a series of long-term, broad-based, strategically based research projects in the supply chain management. Why is it? Why are we doing it? Because here's the reality. We're doing it because our knowledge base is not adequate to the challenges of the future. How's that? Supply chains are transforming. You saw that. Look, listen to John. He's talking about the transformation from tactical cost-based to strategic value-based. And by the way, as soon as you say strategic value-based, you have to talk about your customer. Value comes from the customer. Yet, most of our knowledge is tactical. Despite the large investments in supply chain and supply chain systems, and we're starting to see an explosion of investments, what we found is something interesting. When Don Barsox, who began this process way back in the 1990s, started to study it, he found that there was a gap between the best and the rest. When he studied it again in the late 1990s, he found the gap was getting bigger. When he studied it again, he found the gap was even getting bigger faster. 
Recently, we've gotten more information which says, while the rest are getting better, the best are getting better faster. So we have a challenge. How do we address this gap? And in order to do this, we've put together a research team, which is headed by Dr. Dave Close, and on it is Bixby Cooper, Dr. Patricia Dorothy, Dr. Freyer, Dr. Griffiths, I should also say Dr. Cooper is also a doctor, Nick Little, myself, Stephen A. Melnick, Dr. Raggetts, Dr. Whipple. These are people who are senior, have had years of experience in the field, and they're all unified by their interest to try to figure out what's going on. So what are the key questions that we're looking at? Well, the first question we're asking is, how is the supply chain becoming a strategic asset? Not a tactical, strategic. How is it helping the firm better serve the customer? What are the emerging trends and developments that are shaping the future of supply chain management? Why is it some firms are more successful with strategic supply chain than others, even though, and this is kind of interesting, if you look at the tools, they seem to have the same tools as everyone else. So what have we found? Are you making the right investments? We found a couple of things you want to be aware of. Are you investing in tools, software systems? Are you putting your money into uh, analytics? Are you putting your money into the latest SNLP system? Or are you putting your money into capabilities, competencies, fit? Are you ensuring that what the firm is able to do and what the customer wants and what the strategy requires and what the environment in which it's deployed demand are in sync? It's not the tools, it's capabilities, competencies, and fit. Are you creating or copying? If you're implementing best practices, we've come to an interesting realization. All you're doing is copying. You're not really. You're becoming, in essence, you're, in essence, if what you see is a convergence to mediocrity. Rather, success occurs through differentiation, being different from your competition, from customer focus. This is interesting. One of the things we found is that as we looked at this issue, we found that the customers, uh, firms had epiphanies as soon as they started to understand the problem, not from their perspectives, but from their customers' perspectives. And finally, are you offering them parts or are you offering them solutions? An integrated approach which helps the customer address the problem before them. The answer is no latter. Have you got a set of parts or are you, are you offering a whole solution? Are you fully integrated or are you working in isolation? Are you a cost-driven entity where every function, every element, every silo is working irrespective of the company structure? Or are you integrated not only with the business model, but across with other entities within the organization? Are you, a respond, are you reacting to strategy, or are you a shaper and influencer of strategies and plans that come from the business model? Are you talking to the supply chain organization or to yourself? What does that mean? Are you talking your own language and expecting everyone else to understand? Or are you talking to the C-suite, the people who are critical, the, the CPO, the CFO, the CEO, the CIO? Are you talking to them in terms of their own language? And that language is me measurements and metrics. Are you measuring the problem from your perspective? Or are you measuring it from your customer's perspective? In which case the answer is, are you doing things that make sense to the customer? Are you measuring it from the inside or are you going to the outside with the customer? In essence, this is we've seen before, your, your goal is to do the following when what the customer expects, what we've promised and what we can deliver are in sync with each other. That's what we're trying to explain. That's why the capabilities and competencies, that lower right hand area is so critical. But it's not by itself. It's got to be part of the entire system. By the way, there's a metamorphosis taking place. What does a metamorphosis look like? The metamorphosis really, and this is some preliminary findings. You can see it. It's from implementing practices to building capabilities, from having supply chain solutions to building business solutions for the customer, from having one supply chain that fits all, and we will tailor the customer to fit the supply chain, to recognizing that supply chains have to reflect the customer. Is it? The invisible supply chain. The only time you ever hear about a supply chain is when something goes wrong, so therefore the best supply chain is the one you never hear about. Or is it the visible supply chain, one where we have developed a supply chain where we can show our customers that it can make the desired outcome inevitable? Are we avoiding complexity, trying to simplify 
to the detriment of our customers or are we exploiting, embracing, accepting, using complexity to create advantage? Are we hiring people or are we leading in the development, the recruiting, and the retention of people? Are we simply takers or do we create people, the talent we need? Are we managing internally in our own silos or are we managing and integrating planning so that marketing, engineering, finance, accounting, all of them understand what we do and we understand what they do so their plans reflect our abilities and our limitations. Are we measuring what we want or are we measuring things from our customer's perspective? Are we integrating data or are we integrating organizations? And this is important. We've heard people talk about interoperability, which is not simply being able to share, but who does what? What risk? What are expectations? Are we merging business models? Are they similar? How do we manage risks? It's the notion of bringing and forming linkages quickly, which is more than just being able to talk the same language. And here's something else. Are we planning for today? or are we building for tomorrow? Is our focus not today, but on the future? To do this, and we're at the first stage where we've completed over 50 interviews, over interviews with over 50 companies, we need you. We need you in several ways. You are the missing ingredient that's gonna take us and help us really address these questions. How? Because we have an opportunity for you to participate, to be part of the research study, in which case, not only do you help us, but we will help you by sharing the results telling you what we've uncovered, and to participate in a survey, to participate in case studies, which will be launched this summer, to understand more about the findings and, and the applications, to be part of the webinars in Ju July, September, and November, with dates and locations to be announced. Workshops, specifically, on August 27th and 28th, we invite you down to Michigan State University, which is grand at this time of year, to listen to some of the initial findings where you will learn what we've distilled about how customers, how companies are bridging this gap between where they are and where they want to be. You can have a part in this, in learning and in shaping the results. We will also be repeating, having similar web, uh, workshops in October in Chicago and January with locations to be announced. White papers. We will have white papers being released in June, September, November. Apex Magazine articles, we will have them coming out at these times. And if you want more information, please contact us or follow us at the following site. And finally, some things for you to think about. The new terms that we're going to have you think about. Business solution, capabilities, culture, fit interoperability, metric, metrics and measurement from inside out, from looking from the inside and going to the customer, from the customer in, talent management and leadership. With that, we have launched, begun an interesting and exciting journey. And what we'd like to do at this time is to hear from you. What questions do you have to ask of both John and myself? Thank you. Yes, thank you. And so uh, please feel free to ask a question to uh, John and Steve, and um, you can do that by looking for the questions box on the right of your screen. And let's see what we have. Um, I have a long one, and I'm, I might have to condense it a little bit, but let me see what I have. Um, All right. Well, let's let's see if we can get let's see if this one makes sense to you guys. Um, <clears throat> so Logan asks, uh, not having the ability to manufacture products for our side um, in the medical industry is also a constraint as we have to use buying power to reduce pricing, which puts additional stress on our distribution centers. Um, is this unique to the medical field, or do, do you see this throughout other industries? And I can repeat any part of that if you need it. <laughs> no, I'll take a quick shot at it. I think, you know, one thing that negotiating strategy uh, will tell you is uh, is that, that you always have more uh, power in a negotiation than what you think. And the um, interesting thing in the research, it would say that both sides of a party going into um, any negotiation on average both parties feel like they're in, in a very weak position. And, and it, it's always helped me to understand that, that, that it, you know, I've, I've been on both sides. I've been on the pricing side and I've been on the purchasing side. 
both the selling side as well as the buying side before. And, and what's crazy is in both cases, you feel like you absolutely have no um, leverage or scale that the person on the other side of the table is holding all the cards. And um, I would say that in the, in the purchasing world, it's very typical for us to feel like we don't have any kind of leverage in, on, uh, in, in our particular business. Your engineers have specified particular materials. You have other people specifying services. This is very common in the indirect side. And, and what I would say is a lot of um, suppliers out there really need your business. And so I think you should have the, the confidence in the type of position that you're in, despite the size of your supplier, and, and um, recognize that, that you have a lot more power than what you think, that the research would show that you, the other people on the other side of the um, table are really worried about their lack of, of leverage. So if you can recognize that and use tools like a, a BATNA or the best alternative to negotiated agreement, and, and what you'll, what you'll do is you'll find that the stronger your other options are, um, in many cases, will actually strengthen the position you have with you don't feel like you have any, any scale or leverage over. So um, I just say have more confidence, and, and we always feel like we aren't in a position to do something. But the best way you can strengthen your negotiating leverage with a partner is to strengthen your options to not do business with that partner. Either find out a way not to even consume that product or service or to find somebody else or do it internally. And then once you create those strong options, that ends up translating to a much better position than you can sit at the table if you do, in fact, still decide to work with that supplier. Um, Logan, if I can, first of all, a, a very simple question, but boy, what a good question. Let me start by taking a very different tack from John. Uh, this week, Gartner just announced it's top 25. Now, what's intriguing about Gartner is the Gartner Group is if you look at their top 25, a lot of their top 25 are like hospitals. They really don't make. They're companies like Target. They're companies like Apple. And what these companies have done is they've recognized, first of all, that they don't have to make. That's not their competency. So the first key you've got to understand is when you work with your customer, with your supplier, you have your competencies, they have theirs. And you're going to pick the supplier that works best with you. Number two, the second thing you have to understand is because you don't make something doesn't mean that you don't influence the buy. If you're an Apple, you still design the product. You still build the infrastructure. If you're a healthcare system, you're responsible for delivery. You are the moment of truth. In many cases, the hospital, the patient understands you better than they do the guy that provides you with the supplies. So your goal is, in essence, to structure a relationship that you can communicate what the customer wants, what you want, clearly and unambiguously, and work with the supplier to develop it. And the third thing that you have to understand is we're now dealing in a very interesting environment. In the old days, the old adage was good customers fire bad suppliers. Now it's an environment where good suppliers fire bad customers. Your goal is to be a good customer. That means working with the supplier, you know, communicating on an ongoing basis, make sure that the requirements, the performance measurements, the evaluation requirements are clearly articulated. I have a colleague by name of, by, by the, by the name of Joe Sandor. And Joe has an, you know, I may disagree with a lot with what Joe says, in fact, 99.9%. .9%. But one thing Joe says that I really have to agree with, he says, even if you don't build, your goal is to become the customer of choice. And to do that, you have to approach the relationship differently. You're not a buyer, you're a partner. You're not engaged in the output, you're engaged in the process. You're not simply there to act as an arbitrator, you're there for to shape the transactions. All right, well, let's... So in essence, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, in essence, there's more that you can do that is that's than, per, than the, what you've hinted on. But my question, my answer to you, Logan, is good question, and it's one that really requires a very complex answer. Okay, Chris, what else do we have? Sure. Well, I have one that might require a simpler answer, and this is from Rich. And um, Rich, Rich is asking if the study is focusing on healthcare, or are you looking at a broader audience? Oh, well, let me take this, John, because I'm involved with this. Uh, we are doing this broad-based. Uh, 
in fact, let me tell you something to have you. Rich, first of all, thank you very much for participating and for being part of, this, of the webinar. Uh, one of the things we're doing is we are going beyond healthcare. We are going across industries. We're going, we are also global. Our focus is not simply to focus on North America and the United States. We're looking at North America. We're looking at Africa. We're looking at the Far East. We're looking at Europe. We're not simply looking at healthcare. We're looking at fashion goods industry. We're looking at electronics. We're looking at chip manufacturers. We're capital equipment. We're looking we're looking at some we're looking at equipment that is used to build some of the if you've seen some of the major digging projects, we're looking at the companies that build that equipment. We're looking at companies involved in the production of jet engines. We're looking at a wide variety. What we're trying to do is have as much variety as possible and try to identify what are the factors that are common across and what are the factors which are unique too. And that's one of the reasons, Rich, that we've opened this up and invited you to participate because we want to get your input. We want to help understand what is it that makes your environment different from or unique. And by helping us, you not only help us, ultimately you help you, yourself. Because our goal is to take the information we're getting from this project and to convert it into deliverables, which can be taught, learned, and applied. One of the things that Dave Close and before him, uh, Don Comstock, used to apply, used to uh, talk about, is that not simply being published. He said, "We are researchers who try to have an impact." And finally, one of our goals is we're going to try to have workshops across industries. So essentially, we're going to try to be as broad as possible and to provide information which is useful. John, do you want to add anything else? Okay. Uh, Chris, what else? No, I, I just think that I was, only, I was only asked to just provide some context for uh, supply chain in general, and I had actually started in the research before I came to uh, before I came to Spectrum, and then we went back and answered the questions with the research team with, with my new team. So we were just here for some uh, flavor and some context. Anyway, Chris, what else do you have? Sure. Um, this is more of a request just from a few people. Um, if you could put that email address back on the screen where people can contact you if they want to get involved in the survey, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, okay. Oh, let me, no, there's, there's two email addresses. Let me give you the two email addresses. There is this one. You can get, this is generally, you can contact us at MSU underscore SCM underscore research at broad dot MSU dot EDU, or else you can contact me directly. And it's my last name, Melnick, M-E-L-N-Y-K, at MSU. Okay, but this one right here is the best one. This is the one because I'm going to be out of the country for the next two weeks, but we'll be having people who will be monitoring this email on an ongoing basis. So this is the one to send the items to. Sounds great. All right, so I have a great question from Srinath, and he wants to know, um, why do you think there is a deficit of talent in the industry, despite more people being added to the talent pool every year? Oh, what a, by the way, another great question. And the, the reason it's a great question is for the following reasons. What we're starting to see is two things are taking place in supply chain management. The first is a broadening of awareness, so there's a bigger demand for the basic skills. But here's the real deficit. It's not only do we have a request for skills for people like uh, schedulers and warehouse managers and buyers. We have now, there's a real demand for strategic supply chain leaders. And what I mean by that is people who can interface with top management, who can understand what they're looking for and who can restate that for the supply chain. For people who then who can take new developments, changes in the supply chain, and identify what type of problems can these changes, these innovations be used to answer that the firm has never been able to answer before. So that what you're doing now is you're answering or serving more customers. Uh, there's also the notion that there's just there's just a growth in demand. So if you put things together, what's really happening is, the final comment is the following. In addition to everything else, there are far fewer supply chain schools than there are schools which, will, which have logistics, operations, and purchasing programs. Uh, 
And supply chain is not a subset of any of these. It is a superset. It is something which enables you to integrate things. What makes a supply chain manager so different is not their ability to schedule or place an order or pack a truck. It's the quality of their decisions. It's their capabilities. It's their ability to integrate across. It's their ability to make sure that the solution that they implement on the floor, in the truck, in the field, at the buyer, fits with, supports, and extends the strategy and meets and meets the, the requirements of the customer. Those are relatively new requirements. Consequently, we don't have a lot of schools which are doing it. That's what managers are asking for. They don't want a buyer. They want, a, they want someone who can integrate and who can lead the supply chain and make it into the weapon that it should be. All right, well, let's move on. Um, this might be our last question, unless you, we're about at our hour, unless you guys want to go a little longer, but let's see what, what happens. Um, this is from Lars, and Lars uh, says that you stated that more planning may not be the answer, but rather a focus on flexibility and skills. So how might you get a supply chain manager to dare take this risk to move across? Oh. Well, Lars, that's a good question, and the answer to that is that's one reason why the answer is, what, as we're trying to, as we're pointing out in the work, that if you don't do, the, if you don't build the capabilities and the competencies, planning only gets you part of the way. It, you're not addressing the execution gap, and that's what we're trying to do. And the answer to the question is, how do you take the risk? In essence, you point out to people that planning, while important, while necessary, while critical, is not sufficient, and that what really has to happen is you have to ensure that the plans that you're developing are deployed, are implemented appropriately in a way that's acceptable to the, corp to the company, the people, the environment, the strategy. And that is something that is really just simply pointing out to people. And the way that you point out to people this is the following. And it's, if you look at, and I'll just go back to the Gartner group. If you look at the top 25 in the Gartner Group, what you find are firms which are not simply good at planning, they're extraordinarily good at execution. And to do that, they have to master those last two pillars of the bridge, capabilities and competencies. And the answer is, if you want to be like those top 25, guess what? You can't build the bridge and go from where you are to where you're going to be if you don't have all the pillars in place. And that's reality. I mean, many years ago, ago, King Canute thought that he had the ability to stop water because he was a king. He put his throne into the North Atlantic, commanded the seas to stop, and guess what? They rolled over and buried this and drowned his throne in water. That's the reality. And with that, I think we might have to uh, bring this webinar to a close. I want to thank Stephen and John for their time today. And of course, to all our participants in today's webinar, and if you have any final thoughts, um, you can share them, or otherwise we'll just close up the, uh, the line here. Final comment for me, Steve Melnick, is I want to thank the participants for being part, taking an hour of your time with us. We appreciate it, and we look forward to, as, as was said in Casablanca, to this being the start of a beautiful relationship. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, um, this concludes today's edition of the Apex webinar. All content and materials included in this edition of the Apex webinar are the property of Apex and Michigan State University and are protected by the United States and international copyright laws. All rights are reserved.